and we are live. Welcome to another live stream, everyone. I hope you are ready for a jam-packed live tonight. Come on in, come on in. Welcome to the live. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing for the first time tonight publicly the four steps. And there are four of them. There are four steps you absolutely need to take to master, to no cold, any disease, any medical emergency, any traumatic emergency, how you can study for NREMT, how you can prepare for school, how you can study for maybe midterms right now. I'm going to go over it in this live and breaking down emergencies, different diseases in this live right here so you know it cold. Now, you can see the board behind me. By the way, as you're coming in, uh, give me a hashtag live if you're live. Hashtag live in the chat, comments down below. Hit them both. Why not, right? If you're watching the replay, give me a hashtag replay. Let me know where you're tuning in from. Let me know if you're an EMT student, advanced EMT student, paramedic student. Let me know how you found me here at the Paramedic Coach. My name is Evan, and let's do this live, everybody. Share this live with your classmates. Share this live with your instructors. Why not, right? Spread the word about what we're doing here at the Paramedic Coach. Thank you for all the kind words. I got hello, hi. I'm going to do a few shout-outs here for my live folks. Uh, we have the first comment on here was from... Marlene, we have Kyle, Roman, Jackie, Roman, Edward, uh, we got uh, uh, Kinky, we got KJ, um, Ruben, Hyanna, Edward, uh, Osgod, Oslo, Eric, uh, Shay, Tony, Shelly, we got Brooklyn, Matt, we got Angie, Samantha, Gabriel, we got Okay, we got, we got people rolling in the slide, baby. let's go everybody, let's go, we got Roddy in the live. We got Galaxy, we got Darcy, we got Garam, Natalie, Madison, Shermon. It's going to be a jam-packed live. I got a, a laundry list of things to go over. By the end of this, we are going to know everything cold. Let's go, everybody. Now, here we go. Okay, now, before we get started, okay, you are going to want to stay to the end of this live. This right here is literally the meat and potatoes of becoming great in EMS. This will solve 99.9% .9 of the problems that you're having right now in school, okay? The reason I say that is you still got to put in the work, but I'm going to show you how we do it, okay? Pretty cool? Let's go. So you'll see here, okay, and stay to the end to get the whole package, okay? One, two, three, four, okay? What do we have in what do we have in EMS? What do we have? We need to know if somebody has a chronic disease. We need to know what is going on with our patient right now. What medical emergency might they have? What traumatic emergency might they have so we can treat them appropriately, but not only treat them us, we have to transport them to the correct facility as well. So if we are off with our patient assessments, we're in trouble. Agreed? Agreed? Let me let me on the chat. Agreed? Okay. So there's four steps that you need to use to master content. And if you use these four steps right here, I'm going to break it down with real emergency diseases right now in this live for you. Okay? Then you'll be able to master any content any question on exam, any scenario out in the field, because you know what you're doing. These scenarios on NREMT are not going to fool you because you're going to know this. And nobody talks about it. Everyone just says, take prax questions, take prax questions, but you're not going over the contents. You have weaknesses. And after working with now over 10,000 plus students inside my program, and going through this and getting messages and talking to all of you, I have this down to a science. So please hear me. Okay. Now, here we go. Number one, number one, the first thing we must do 
is you need to be able to explain the emergency or disease simply like you're talking to me at a third, fourth, fifth grade level. If you can't do that, you don't know it cold. Okay, so first is, let's, I'm going to write it out for you, okay? What is it? So what exactly are you talking about? What is it? So for example, we're going to talk about pulmonary embolism. We're going to talk about pneumothorax. We're going to talk about CHF. We're going to talk about pulmonary edema. We're going to talk about asthma. We're going to talk about COPD, right? How do you, can you explain it simply to me? Because how are you going to explain it to your patients? when they're the one going through it and they're looking at you and they're looking up at you, right? So what is it? Can you do that first? The second piece, what are the risk factors? What are the risk factors of what we're talking about? Now, hang on, before I go any further, I'm gonna go in two seconds to tell you the last two, hang with me. Students ask me all the time, Evan, when do I know I'm ready to take the NREMT exam? When do I know I've, per or on the other end, when do I know I prepared enough for EMT school? How do I know I can go confident into paramedic school? We all know there's two things I have down to a science. One, getting you prepared for school and getting you through school. And the second is getting through that NREMT, right? So those are the two spots. If we prep well, we're going to know this. Way in advance. And my best students, they prepare before school even starts. Again, no one talks about that, right? It's most important, okay? If you prepare before school, then you have a leg up on the acceleration, okay? Then when NREMT comes, you've been doing this the whole time. That's why you're here on the live tonight to get ahead of the game. If you just started school in September, we got plenty of time. We got plenty of time. So hang with me. Number three, what are the hallmark signs and symptoms? The number one question I get asked, what are the signs and symptoms of this? What are the signs and symptoms of that? You got to know that. So that's number three. Can you please tell me the signs and symptoms? And we're going to break this down, okay? So hang with me. And the last piece, you probably may have guessed it. Well, if we know what it is, we know the risk factors, we know the signs and symptoms, how do we actually treat it? What do we do? How do we treat it? Okay. What's the treatment? Okay. Whether we're BLS CMT or ALS Advanced CMT or Paramec, we're going to go over that tonight, okay? So, can I share something with you early? <laughs> can I share something with you early? I'm going to do it right now, okay? Here it is. When students come to me and say, am I ready for NREMT? My first question is, are you studying content? Have you been studying all the diseases, all the key terms, right? If I give you a key term, do you know it? If I give you, do this in your head right now. Do this in your head right now. We're going to go over it later, but just right now, if I told you, tell me about congestive heart failure, could you explain to me at third grade level? Could you tell me what the risk factors are of CHF? Could you tell me the exact signs and symptoms? Could you tell me the treatment for your provider level? If you do, you, get, you, you got CHF. Because if I give you a question on CHF about the signs and symptoms, you're going to pick that up in the question, okay? If you see a risk factor for CHF and it needs a treatment, you're going to pick up on it. If they ask you point blank, what, what do you think is going on with the patient? You pick up on it, you see? So this is how we do it. Again, no one's talking about it. This is why I work so hard on this channel to get this information to you because nobody else wants to talk about this, okay? All right, so now we know this, let's get in to the first disease emergency topic, okay? Now, if you got a question in the chat, feel free, blast the chat. If I have time during this live, I'll, I wanna, so many, there's so many comments and messages, we have 84 people on the live. Now, if you have a question, an education question, while I'm going through this or about anything, 
feel free to drop it in the chat. I will try my best to get to some of your questions throughout. So if you've got a, a question about education, anything, something you have a problem with, drop it in the chat. I'll take a few in between. The, I'll pick a few out in between the disease, and I'll scroll through. Fair, fair? Okay, cool. So here we go. So this is how we do it, okay? So before we do this, I do want to say more with Pearl, a tip I can give you. Let's say you're in school right now. And let's say you're going over a certain emergency disease. You can use these four things right here to test yourself before your quiz, test yourself before your school exam to know if you know it. You can go back and forth with your, your par uh, partner or back and forth with your classmate on these four things. Again, if you know these four things, a question cannot trip you up. It can't because you know the content, Colt. It can't, right? All you got to do then is read the question, identify a sign and symptoms, and identify any risk factors, identify a certain scene, and put it all together and answer the question because you know it. So this, before I go into the first one, these four questions right here uncover if you really know it cold or you don't. Because I get a lot of students that come to me and say, Evan, you know, I, 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 I know it. I, I know I got this, but I can't pass the exam. Or I had to go through school multiple times or, or I, I couldn't get through my exam. But I'm, but I'm really good out in the field. The field skills are great. But if you really knew it cold like this, you would have gotten through. Fair? Okay. Let's do the first one. And we're starting with pneumothorax. Now, I'm not just going to talk about tension pneumothorax. So I'm gonna, we're going to call this just pneumothorax. And I'm going to talk broadly here about all the different types of scenarios. So we're going to call this just plain old pneumothorax. And then I'm going to differentiate pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, medical trauma. But this is your pneumothorax section, OK? We have 96 people on the live. And I just announced this today. Let's go, everybody. Let's get this live to 100. If you got classmates, maybe you got a group chat. Maybe uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, partners that want to relearn this information. Share the live with them. Bring them on here. Let's get this live to 100. We're 12, only 12 minutes in. Let's go. All right. Here we go, folks. So pneumothorax. So first thing, what is it? Okay. What is it? Now, to be clear. When we're going over this stuff, I may write some things down here, but I, I know as the viewer, I don't want to bore you me writing this out. OK, so I may write down some key things here, but I'm mainly going to talk to you. Is that OK? OK, so with the what is I'm going to actually act it out with some of the other things I may write it down for you. Fair? OK, so. Here's the key thing we need to know about pneumothorax. So if I'm doing my, what is it? Explain to me like a third grader. Here it is. Okay. If I get penetrating trauma, which means if let's say I get shot, let's say I get stabbed, right? And wherever this is my right hand, it's my right chest. Okay. So here it is. Here I am. Okay. Now here's underneath my skin here is my lung, right? So my lung has, a, has a, a cavity, a space around it, right? Okay. We call that the pearl space, okay? Now, if I get shot or stabbed right here, what's going to happen is air from the outside world, air is all around us, air from the outside world is going to come into my chest cavity, okay? Into my lung cavity, which we just call the pearl space, the space around the lung, okay? It's how you remember it. When air comes in, it fills that space. But that space is normally filled by the expanded lung, the lung, the healthy lung, right? But now we have air coming in from the outside world, pushing, 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 pressing on the lung, and there's not enough room for the outside air and the lung. So the lung collapses. It collapses. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, I'm going to stop there. But just think right now. 
if I have one of my lungs collapsing, what do you think I'm good? What do you think my sign symptoms are going to be? Right? What do you think my risk factors are going to be? What, what do you think I might do to treat this? Just think in your head, okay? Right? Eat, paint in the picture? Okay, good. Now, we get into a tension pneumothorax when a few things happen. So if I have an, a, a, just a pneumothorax, well, we have that same action of the lung collapsing. Okay, fair? When we get into tension pneumothorax, now we're involving other players. This is where we see trachea deviation because what happens is the air from the outside world is pressing, 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 pressing on everything inside our mediastinum. It's pressing over. Our heart's over here. Eventually, this pressure is so great, this lung is completely collapsed, and we're putting pressure on our heart. And if we understand heart blood flow, which I've shared with you many times, okay, if you understand heart blood flow, when the heart fails as a pump, blood backs up. And when blood backs up, we get symptoms I'm going to share with you in a moment. Okay, so just hang with me, okay? But when the heart fails the pump and the heart can't pump blood, is our pressure going to go up or down? Well, eventually it's going to go down because the heart can't pump blood, so our blood pressure goes down because the heart has failed as a pump, okay? So when this happens, that's where we're in tension pneumothorax, okay? And tension pneumothorax is a type of obstructive shock because the pressure here's how, here's how i remember it the pressure is obstructing the heart from doing its job it's not the heart's fault that's cardiogenic shock is the heart's fault right not the heart's fault the heart is under attack by the air pressure cool that's how you remember it we hit 100 let's go beautiful okay now that is pneumothorax explained simply Okay, so now we understand that, we can check that off. Okay, we understand it now. If we don't understand it, none of this makes sense. This pattern, if you think about it, it might remind you of how I teach uh, drug cards. You know, when I teach people about uh, drug cards for a paramedic school, I say, hey, if you know the mechanism of action, everything else gets filled in, right? Drug cards aren't hard. But you just need to know the mechanism of action. So same with this. If I know what it is, I get a pretty good idea of what I might uncover. Okay? So the second piece, what are the risk factors? Well, there's two types. There's a medical, so there's a medical pneumothorax, and then there's a traumatic pneumothorax. So the one that most of you are familiar with, okay, and there's a reason I've chosen this first. I'm going to share with you in two seconds. Hang with me. Most of you are familiar with the traumatic pneumothorax. I just explained to you, right? But what's a medical pneumothorax? And how does that happen? Well, the most common one, and I'm going to come back in, okay? The most common one is someone, is a young, remember this one, is a young, tall, thin male. They are known to have spontaneous medical pneumothoraxes, okay? They are known for that, okay? So if you get a test question about, we're gonna go over the signs and symptoms in a minute, but we go over and you see a tall, thin, male, difficulty breathing, chest pain, right? JVD, we're gonna go over it, JVD, right? Hypotensive, maybe that's it, okay? Now, the reason I want to start with pneumothorax is this. I put out a question on my YouTube and all my socials. I did a full-length YouTube video on this. And I also did um, uh, a short of a question asking about pulmonary embolism, which we're going to do later on. And the A, it was the wrong answer. C was correct for what I was talking about. But everyone was saying that it was that the person was having a pulmonary embolism and they were saying that it was a young, thin, tall, lanky. No, 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 no. That's pneumothorax. That's pneumothorax. So I wanted to clear that up. Okay. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? What are the signs and symptoms? Well, chest pain. 
Okay. Now, uh, but there's more. I'm going to explain to you. But there's more. Okay. Yes, chest pain, but there's more. Okay. So let me let me explain. So my lung is collapsing. I have chest pain. Duh. That makes sense. Okay. The hallmark sign symptom with a pneumothorax is we have absent lung sounds on the side that is, that is being affected. Why? Because we have no lung in that chest anymore. That's why. We know if the lung's collapsing. So if I don't have a lung anymore, I'm not gonna hear any lung sounds. That's it, right? So if I listen, I don't hear any lung sounds. What's happening? The lung's collapsing. Okay, so you're telling me the lung's collapsing and there's air in this pocket. Okay, so I gotta get the air out of the, out of this chest, and I gotta let the air escape so the lung can reinflate. That's it. How do we do that? How do we do that? What's well, called a needle decompression. A needle decompression. Okay. I wish I had one of the uh, decompression needles with me. Let me see if I can grab one real quick. I don't. I shouldn't be doing this again off the live. Hang with Tacky for a second. Hit subscribe. I'm going to grab one just for you. I think I have one here. Hang with me, folks. I'm doing this for you. We're going off camera. We're going off the script. I think I have one here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. I got one right here. Going off script, folks. Going off script. And we actually gained two people from going off. Uh, we'll take it. Okay. So right here, you can see right here. Okay. This is our decompression needle here. Okay, I just want to show you what it looks like. Okay, cool. So this needle, what we're going to do is we're going to place this needle in the second intercostal space. What? Whoa. What's that? Okay. Remember one of the first things that I said to you? You need to understand the content, the diseases but you need to understand medical terminology and key terms or you'll get lost. So intercostal spaces are simply the spaces in between ribs. That's it. Okay. And by the way, I'm going to give you one more pearl. Okay. Anytime you have a word in medicine that you are, and there's so many different words, but if anytime you have a word you're unfamiliar with in medicine, break it down simply. I'll give you an example here, okay? So we all know, everyone knows heart attack, right? Myocardial infarction. Myo means muscle. Cardio sounds like cardiac, so I'm talking about heart muscle. Infarction means death. Oh, you're telling me in a heart attack that heart muscles die. Okay, cool. Okay. So break it down. Okay, but you got to know the key terms. Okay, so now we have this space full of air. We use, okay, our needle decompression. Air is now able to escape. And now we are able, and also I didn't mention, second intercostal space, it's mid-clavicular line. So we go to the middle of our clavicle, and then we go down, okay, and so we're in between the second and third rib. And then we're going to slide right above the third rib. We don't want to hit the, the nerves and vasculature underneath the second rib. So slide on top of the third rib. Slide. It's also easier if you're sliding on top. It makes it easier. Okay? Rush of air. And there we go. Okay? Now, there are other spots. But to keep it basic here, we'll, we'll keep on those spots. Pretty cool? Cool. Okay. Now. What else could we do for this patient? That was, this is this is an ALS skill. This is an ALS skill, right? What about a BLS? What, I'm an EMT. What do I do? Well, if you're an EMT, what we're going to do is we're going to provide oxygen to the patient. Okay. Now, depending on your protocol in your area, you may do a, a three-sided dressing to let air escape, right? Some folks may not do that anymore. Some may. Okay. I still I still like it. Okay, do a three cider. So basically, what you do, you get a piece of plastic and you go three cider, air can escape, but it can't go in. Okay, 
The other thing you can do, I'm going to give you another pearl. If you have an unresponsive patient who needs ventilation, using a bag valve mask to give positive pressure ventilations will help. It will help in a pneumothorax. So think about that on exam day as well. Okay. And then obviously this patient is going to need a trauma center. So those are going to be our main pearls with pneumothorax. But now we know it. Now we understand it. If I was doing it in a step-by-step -step fashion, I show up to a pneumothorax. Well, if the patient's awake and they're speaking in full sentences, I'm not going to put a BVM on them, right? Because they maintain their own airway. But they have a pneumothorax, an attention. Okay, well, I'm going to give them oxygen, right? And then I'm going to take care of it with a neo decompression, right? Now, if they're unresponsive and not talking to me, then I'm, like, I'm going to go BVM, and then I'm going to go with the decompression. Cool? Okay. Good. Good. I love it. Okay, folks. So now we are going to get into the next piece. Okay? So our next one, our next one up is going to be, da -da 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 -da, is going to be, what do we got next here? Let's do pulmonary embolism. Okay, so pulmonary embolism, what is it? Okay, and then later on, we're going to talk about pulmonary edema and CHF. Okay, so here we go. First, number one, what is it? So pulmonary embolism is not pulmonary edema. Pulmonary embolism is not pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema, I'm going swimming because there's blood in my lungs. Pulmonary embolism has nothing to do with bronchi. I'll say it again. Pulmonary embolism has nothing to do with bronchioles. It's got nothing to do with bronchi. It's got nothing to do with any of that. It's got to do with the vasculature. Pulmonary embolism is a lung attack. So with a heart attack, I'm going to block your coronary artery so heart muscle dies. When you have a pulmonary embolism, I'm going to block your pulmonary artery tracts so your lung tissue dies. Okay? It's a lung attack. In a stroke, I'm going to block your cerebral arteries, most commonly the middle cerebral artery. Okay? And your brain is going to die. Okay? That's what it is. So strokes of brain attack, okay? We know the heart attack and pulmonary embolism, a emboli, a piece of plaque, clout, whatever you want to say, or it makes you happy out there. That's a lung attack. Pulmonary edema, I'm swimming, I'm drowning in blood. I'm drowning in blood. Different. Cool? We're going to talk about it later. Right now, it's pulmonary embolism. So here's what commonly happens. I'm going to give you how many scenarios? I'm going to give you three, three different scenarios you could get with pulmonary embolism. Three. I honestly have to give you two, but I thought of another one, so why not? And these are all from my experience. So here we go. Number one, you get a patient with new onset chest pain. Difficulty breathing, tachycardia, let's say 120, they're hypoxic, 92%. But they're young. They're in their 20s or 30s or 40s. They're young. They're pretty healthy, but they smoke. They're awake and talking to you, but they got a problem and they call 911. That is our first type of person who gets pulmonary embolism, smokers. Okay? We'll explain. Number two, a patient, and this is two for one here, and I'll get to number three. Excuse me. A second patient, I want you to think about sitting still or laying still. Sitting still or laying still means what if I got off a 16-hour plane, plane ride? I'm sitting still. What if I'm in bed rest because I just had surgery? I'm in bed rest for three weeks. I'm laying still. Okay, that's person number two that could get a pulmonary embolism. We're going to talk about it. The third person, you get called CPR in progress, and you're at a cardiac arrest. 
Don't forget my medics, my ALS people. Don't forget your H's and T's. What's one of the T's? Thrombosis. What are they talking about about thrombosis? P-E and M-I. Did you forget it? I hope not, because it is. You have a patient. One of the first cardiac arrest calls I ever did when I was a, a, a back when I was a precepting um, uh, for my med control was a cardiac arrest, and it, we assumed it was a PE, okay, based on the patient's history. We're going to talk about it, okay? Now, here we go. Now, put my uh, needle away there. Okay, here we go, folks. What it is, this is the most common way it happens. That was a little background. Let's say I have a blood clot. It's called a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. So a deep vein inside my leg. Veins go towards the heart. Arteries go away from the heart. Remember your heart, blood flow. Everything in medicine makes sense. Okay? So hang with me. Here we go. If I have a clot in my deep vein, in the area of my calf, you can't see my leg, but it's there, I promise, okay? And, and let's say I have, I'm going to use this as the, the, I'll use this as the clot, okay? And, it, and veins go towards the heart. So here's the vein coming towards my heart. Here's my heart over here. Might look backwards to you, hope not. I'm coming through, I'm coming through, I'm coming through, I'm coming through, I'm coming through. Eventually, I'm going to hit the IVC, the inferior vena cava. Then eventually I'm going to have SBC IVC comes in to the right atria. That's the venous side because veins, venous, goes back to the heart. Okay. When this blood goes back to the heart, I'm going to hit my right atrium. I'm going to go through a valve, the tricuspid valve. The way you can remember it is three comes before two with the valves, if you, you know. If you, if you get it, I hope that worked, okay? So tricuspids first, right atrium, tricuspid. Now I'm in my right ventricle. Okay, what's the job of the right ventricle? To pump blood to the lungs. Uh, I'm going to pump blood to the lungs. But I got a piece of plaque, a, a, a piece of clot right here that's going through my system. So it goes to the pulmonary artery tracts, Okay. If this clot, we'll call it this clot right here, get, goes high up onto the pulmonary artery and gets stuck, your car, here's, how you, here's how I remember it. Your cardiac arrest, man. If it goes and it goes maybe to the, maybe the middle or it's a small one lower, you're the first two people that I talked about. You're talking in awake, but man, you got a problem. But man, you got a problem. Okay? Cool. With me? Okay. What are, what are signs of a DVT? What are signs of a DVT? Okay, here they are. I don't have, if you look at one person's leg versus the other leg, one leg, one calf is much larger. Much larger. There could be redness, there could be pain, but the, the, the actual size is a clear cut sign, okay? And remember something simple, I'm gonna say something simple. If a person already has problems, like they've had a stroke, or they've had heart disease, or they've had other clots in the past, why can't they have a clot right now? Right. Remember the cardiac risk factors, smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and the one thing that no one can solve, family history, and age, okay, and age, okay? Now, with that being said, what are the risk factors of pulmonary embolism? Well, there's a lot. Smoking is number one. Bed rest, pregnancy, I'm going to explain, cancer. Birth control. You're probably thinking, whoa, okay. Hey, Evan, you're throwing all kinds of stuff out here. Hang with me, okay? 
The first thing I'm going to share with you, something powerful. It's a big word, but hang with me. I know you're smart. You've got this. You're going to be an EMS professional. You've got this. Don't worry about it. I got you. Hypercoagulable states. Holy cow. Whoa. It's a crazy word, man. Come on, man. I'm getting off a lot. That was me, okay? I understand. A hypercoagulable state. Let's break it down. Hyper is too much. We talk about coagulation in the body. That means we're talking about clotting in the body. State means the state that you're in. I'm present. I'm here right now. That's my state. Right, right. So a hypercoagulable state means I'm in a state where I'm ready to have a clot. Okay. What that is, is pregnancy, cancer, birth control, smoking. These are hypercoagulable states. Okay. These are people that are more at risk. The first three really being the main ones. Pregnancy, cancer, right? Birth control would be the real ones. Smoking is a risk factor. Now, what else? Recent surgery, va recent vascular surgery would be a risk factor, right? Make sense? Yes, that would make a lot of sense. Now, you're probably wondering, Evan, why are you always hammering, hammering, hammering me about pulmonary embolism? You talk about it all the time. Why do you do it? My friends, here is why. Because I've seen too many providers and I've seen too many patients misdiagnose pulmonary embolism. I even had so someone that I know, okay, someone that I know that was misdiagnosed with this. And they thought it was something else and it was a PE. Literally, in my own personal life, if someone says, I got chest pain, I didn't really bring out this and that, the first thing I said to him, was, dude, you might have a PE. And I was right. And I was right. So what I'm trying to say to you is this. If you always thinking about the possibility of a pulmonary embolism, you won't miss it. In my humble opinion, pulmonary embolism is the number one missed thing out there in emergency medicine, and I have no idea why when I'm talking about it all the time. You got to know this, folks, okay? And I'm not going to get too crazy here, but I do want to share this with you. You'll see doctors, and I hate anybody, but you'll see doctors, you'll see PAs, I've seen other medics, I've seen nurses totally disregard it. Oh, it can't be. And it ends up being it. So let me tell you, just be on the lookout for it, and you won't get burned. Document on your chart that you asked about some of the risk factors, but you didn't see them, and you cover your butt. Okay? Cool? Cool. So those are the risk factors. What are the hallmark signs and symptoms? Okay? Now, again, there's chest pain, but let's talk about it more. Okay? Now, here it is. Chest pain. Difficulty breathing. But here's the main pearl with pulmonary embolism. Remember, don't forget pulmonary embolism has to do with the arteries, the vasculature, not the bronchioles or the bronchi. Not the bronchioles or the bronchi, folks. So if I listen to your lungs and you have pulmonary embolism, I'm not going to hear any of those crazy lung sounds that we talk about. I'm not going to hear a wheezing. I'm not going to hear rails. I'm not going to hear a bronchi. I'm either going to hear clear lung sounds or diminished, bilaterally diminished lung sounds because they're dying, okay? But I'm not going to hear no, one or the other. No, I'm, see, they're both either clear or both diminished. That's what's going to happen, okay? Don't forget the risk factors. Now, the big pearl is tachycardia and hypoxia with chest pain, difficulty breathing. Don't forget the leg exam and ask about your risk factors. Are you pregnant, smoking, birth control, any bed rest, any long plane rides, train rides, bus rides, any recent surgery? There it is. You're out. Oh, it took two seconds. I get teach it for 10 minutes. That's all it is. That's it. Okay. If you just do that on every chest pain and just investigate it, it won't get burned. Okay. Cool. What do we do? What do we do? 
I guarantee you somebody on this live is 102 people out here. I guarantee you that no one ever even talked to you about pulmonary embolism. I bet you no one talked to you about it. How are we going to treat it? Well, the way that we're going to treat pulmonary embolism is we're going to give oxygen and get them to a hospital, lights and sirens. And we're going to do an EKG and we're going to do an IV, right? That's what we're going to do. Okay. Now you're probably, oh, Evan, we can't solve this. This one we can't solve. EMS, we can't solve. They need, hep they need heparin. Heparin's a drug they're going to use in a hospital to drip it in and take care of that. So they can get, take care of that clot, that plaque issue. Okay. I can, and I'll say it one last time, paint this picture in your head. I literally, I, I, I can, almost like I can visualize it right now. I can visualize the, the last patient I brought in with a PE, like he's right here. You can visualize the scene, okay? Under 40 years old, smoker, was shocked, and then I walk in later on, heparin drip. Don't forget it. Let's move on. So now we're going to talk about CHF, CHF, okay? And here comes our favorite, our favorite one, which is pulmonary edema. Now, I'm going to do, before we move on, I'm going to, I'm going to scan, I'm going to scan a little, a little halftime show, a little halftime show. We're 41 minutes in and we're at a halftime show. This is like a, a full game here. I love it. I got two more uh, scenario, uh, little scenarios to go over. Okay. So I'm going to go through some of these questions that you have. Okay. So I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning to be fair. And I'm going to scan for questions that will make sense here. Let's see. Ivan, I'll, I'll call, just do some call outs while I'm going. Ivan, Brooklyn. Um, okay, so uh, Joseph Melanda says, my exam is next week, not ready. Joseph, I have a resource called my video study course. Uh, I'll put the link in the description. I'll also put it in the comments that can help you with National Registry Prep, my friend. It's all there, okay? Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Rob says, is it harder than FISDAP? So I, I plan on doing a video on this, FISDAP versus NREMT. I would say that they're pretty, I'd say they're pretty equal. I'd say they're pretty equal. Some people may have different opinions. I'd say they're pretty equal. I'd say they're pretty equal, right? Um, different in grading though, of course. Okay, uh, Kinky makes a good point. You've got to read the questions thoroughly. I want to give you a tip on that real quick. So when you are looking at a question on NREMT, I cannot tell you, even the practice question that I put out here on YouTube, uh, some of you that I reached out to who got it wrong um, when on, um, on Instagram, without Instagram, because I can see the DMs coming in. Uh, if they got it wrong, I reach out to, hey, like this is what the answer was, right? They read the question too fast, and when I and I showed the, the when I showed the patient that was going on, they chose the wrong answer. They just jumped the the first thought was. So here's how you actually read a question. If no one's ever taught you, I'm a teacher right now. Do not look at the answers until you do the following things. You're going to read the question once, then you're going to read the question again. Do still do not look at the answers. You've read the question how many times? Two times. I then want you to stop, okay? This is especially on a scenario-based question. And say, what would I do next? What's going on with this patient? What do I, number one, what do I think is going on? Number two, are, is the question giving me clear-cut risk factors that I learned about from the paramedic coach? Is the question giving me clear-cut signs and symptoms that I learned from the paramedic coach? Is the patient presenting with certain things that I know about because I went through these four things. See? And then, only then, look at the answers. So if we get a patient who's been on bed rest and has chest pain is really breathing, we know it's pulmonary embolism. What's the next best step in this patient? Give them oxygen is the next best step. <laughs> right? And, and then we go from there. Cool? So let's see if we got anybody here. And by the way, I just want to say one thing. The chat is overwhelmingly 
positive and I cannot thank you enough for sharing this live. I can't thank you enough for everyone who joins the video study course. I cannot thank you enough for subscribing to subscribe to this channel. We're about to hit 40K subscribers, everybody. Let's go. Okay. Um, it's amazing what we've done, guys. It's amazing what we've done. You know, I've been wanting to get this information out for a long time to help people, and we're doing it. So I'm very happy. Um, so thank you for the kind words. I, you know, much love to you all, too. All right. Do we have any other questions here? Okay, so Joel says, what is the question between a simple pneumothorax and a tension pneumothorax? So the main thing, Joel, with the difference is, one, we have that tracheal deviation that goes to the hypotension. So if our patient's hypotensive, we have tracheal deviation, right? It's a late sign. What this tracheal deviation moving the trachea means is the air from the pneumothorax putting pressure on the heart, Okay. When we have that happen, the heart fails to pump hypotension, that's when we're under tension, okay? We lose our blood pressure, okay? Everyone, I, I, I could, I love to, I would call everybody out, but I don't want you to get bored here on the live. Um, I'll just say thank you to Haley. Um, thank you to Catherine. Thank you to C, um, everybody else. Nick. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Alyssa says, yes, this will be posted after. All my live streams are posted on a playlist uh, on YouTube, and they're always posted after. Yes, of course. Um, any more questions here? Let me see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little farther. Wow. Well, that ah, chat is blowing up. Okay, that's good. I like that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, give me a good question here, folks. Okay, here we go. Masson says, can you give aspirin during PE? Uh, no, that would not be in our protocol for pulmonary embolism. You're going to do oxygen, and you're going to do transport for pulmonary embolism. They're going to need heparin. Aspirin is for a heart attack patient. Now, do we have x-ray vision to know if someone's having a heart attack versus a PEMS? No. If we get somebody with chest pain and difficulty breathing, there's nothing wrong with giving them aspirin. That's in our protocol. Someone calls 911, which you don't do every day, says, I have chest pain and difficulty breathing. You give them aspirin 324. As long as they're not allergic, that's completely fine. Okay. Um, now, if you go to a medical doctor, and they've called 911 for the patient. They showed up at my urgent care center and we did a scan and they have a PE, you know. They need to go to the ER, take them there, don't give them aspirin because, you know, different scenario. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Someone had a question about uh, croup and epiglottitis. Good question. So, a few differences. So first, croup. And so we have croup on one side, epiglottitis on the other, okay? So the first thing we look at with these two things is croup usually comes on more slowly than epiglottitis. Usually epiglottitis, that will wake you up in the middle of the night, okay? Now the thing is, both these emergencies, they both have strider. The difference is an, is an age issue, is an age issue that you can also look at. So croup is going to be younger, is in much, much younger, right? Like a four-year-old, okay? Epiglottitis can act like croup wouldn't happen in an older child or an adult, only in younger children. So if the age and the question alone could tell you, okay? So go around four years old for your croup. Epiglottitis could happen to anybody, even someone who's older can have epiglottitis. And on that, remember, there's five different things about that can cause strider to happen. So you got two of them, croup and epiglottitis. Well, what else do we have? We have foreign body airway obstructions. We also have anaphylaxis. And we have inhalation burns that can cause as well. 
Okay. Um, another good question here from Todd. What age do you no longer recommend someone being a medic? I, is that a great question? I this question a lot. So it is no secret that most EMS agencies are run by 20 year old, 20, somebody in their you know, 20 somethings, 30 somethings, and people in their 40s. But I, I, you should really, really, really see this. There's two things I want you to see. Number one is that there is a ton of new equipment that makes older adults able to work the job longer. You should really look this up if you're someone who's an older adult. Uh, out of Florida, I believe it was Sun City, Florida. Shout out to them, to them if they're watching. They did a piece, I think it was Vice, I saw it in my feed months ago. Um, I might even do a reaction video to it. It was I probably will at some point. Um, it was an older community, and they were coming together, and they have an EMS station, and they're run by the people in the uh, senior community. So these people are 65 plus, and they're EMS, and they're lifting and moving patients because they have techniques to be able to do it and equipment to be able to help them. So... The final word on that would be there's never an age where I'm not going to recommend you to go for your dream. There's never an age where I'm going to say that you can't do something, right? You can do anything. As long as you are driven, you can, I believe, you can accomplish anything in life. It may take you longer than this guy or this girl. But, you know, one of the main rules that I tell myself in life is as the paramedic coach, I never can. I never compare myself to anybody else. As Evan, I never compare myself to others. I only focus on my own success, right? And my whole success is about helping you. Fair. Um. So CPAP question. So the question about CPAP. Excuse me. So with CPAP, we're going to talk about CPAP. CPAP has to do with pulmonary edema. Okay, pulmonary edema is that's where we're going to actually uh, use CPAP in that. But CPAP, it's positive pressure. We normally breathe on negative pressure. So it's positive pressure. And we're going to push the fluid out of the lungs. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to do one more question, folks. Then we're going to move on to our next, next piece. Last question I am, I'm seeing here is from Ivan. So Ivan, if you look up uh, a 12-lead EK. 12 week EKG criteria for pulmonary embolism. It's S1, Q3, T3. Okay, you can look it up. Just Google it up and you can find that uh, 12 week EKG for, you can see it, it's on Google uh, for pulmonary embolism. It's not really like specific. It's not the, there is a criteria. It could be a, it could be a question. I've done videos on it before on my channel. Um, I believe, I think I did a video on, uh, I did, on like, uh, on flip T waves. On, on flip T waves, I talk about that. So if you type in the paramedic coach T waves, uh, you'll see a full video on it. I show the full EKG and everything. So great questions, guys. That worked out pretty well. I'm pretty happy about that. So here we go. Uh, Mass and Township. True. I'm 60 and run fire and EMS every day as an assistant chief. There we go. See? It's all about uh, my medic got hers at 50. We also have several other medics 50 and over. See? Beautiful. I love it. I love it. Okay, folks, here we go. Let's get into it. So next piece we're talking about is CHF. Now, if you're just joining us, there are four ways to break down any disease or any medical or traumatic emergency. How many is four different Ways. This is how you break down any NREMT question. This is how you break down any disease or emergency. One, you got to tell me what it is simply. Two, what are the risk factors? Are there any? Three, what are the signs and symptoms? And four, how do we treat it? Okay, now let's get into CHF. So, CHF, I'm going to draw this out for you because it's going to help you a lot, okay? So I'll keep this here. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I just got to show you something. Okay, come with me. So here's my heart, okay? 
I'm going to draw the four chambers. Okay, right atria, left atria, right ventricle, left ventricle. Okay. Now, over here, SVC, IVC. That's the venous blood, the blood, the deoxygenated blood. I don't have any oxygen. I already used it. I already dropped it off the cells. I'm coming back to the heart to get more oxygen. Okay? Over here. Okay? Now, if my heart, and this has to do with any sort of problem that the heart may have, if my heart fails as a pump, what's going to happen? Blood eventually is going to back up. If you're a student of mine, you're one of my course students online, I talk about this. Blood backs up. So hang with me, okay? Now, we all know, and now, this isn't, I'm not going to do a full heart blood flow lesson right here, but I have plenty of videos on my channel on that. I just want to show you real quick. Blood goes through here, right atria, right ventricle. Where we go next, we have to go to the pulmonary artery. We go to the lungs. We come back. Pulmonary vein, left atria, left ventricle, round to the aorta. Okay? Now, again, look, if we're going in this direction, okay, if the left side of my heart fails as a pump and I have left sided heart failure, this is what I'm going to get. Blood is not going to go forward, it's going to go backward. And I'm going to pump blood because my heart isn't pumping into the lungs. And then I'm swimming in my lungs, right? I have blood. I have fluid in my lungs because blood back. Remember this for the rest of your career. Blood backs up in CHF. And, and let me I'll tell you something right now. If you do not understand heart blood flow. You will not understand anything in EMS. It is the most important lesson I can teach you. Okay? So look, if blood backs up from the left ventricle, because it ain't going forward, it backs up in the left atria. If the left, left, if the left side fails from the left atria, blood backs up, pulmonary vein, backs up in the lungs. Now we have blood or swimming fluid in the lungs. This is why, my friends, when you have a CHF patient, what every single exam says, they cough up pink, frothy sputum because they literally are coughing, they're coughing up blood. Now, hang on. This will all makes sense. Hang with me. Okay. What if the right side of my heart fails the pump? So blood backs up, right ventricle, right atria. Now, superior, superior vena cava. Superior means above vena cava. That sounds like vein. That sounds like venous. It is inferior down below, inferior vena cava. That sounds like inferior vein, inferior venous. Yeah. Blood backs up into the venous system. What do I end up getting? If I go down inferiorly, I get edema in my ankle, in my legs. If I go up superiorly, I get JVD, big JVD in my neck. JVD, edema in my legs. So we'll call it uh, leg pitting edema, right? If over here I have pulmonary edema, that's it, right? So when the heart fails as a pump, 
the heart can, and just so you're aware, if you notice a trend, is the trend. When I said earlier, the heart failed at a, as a pump, right? For, for pneumothorax, we got JVD. See? Make sense? Okay. So now we understand this. That is what CHF is. The heart is failing as a pump and blood backs up. Okay? If we remember that, we'll know what to expect when the heart fails. And this is the ultimate heart failure, congestive heart failure. Okay? So I'm going to erase this. Okay? And don't worry, you'll have it on the replay. And if you want to learn more about this stuff, and if anything in this live got your alarm bells, got your brain going, I have an entire video study course with my best content that is direct, short, concise, straight to the point, and goes over all this information, right? Here we're going and going all over about the video study course is clear cut, straight to the point. Watch this video, get the information, pass school, pass your exams, my life's work. You can learn more at prepareforems.com. Prepareforems.com. Nick says in EMT class right now, I learn more from you than my instructor. Thank you for that. It means a lot to me. If you want to learn even more, everybody out there, put, I just put the link in the uh, comments. It's also a link in the description. Join my video study course. I'm doing an offer right now for a lifetime access okay, to the whole course. And the course will not only help you with stuff like this, career advice, skills, medications, anatomy and physiology. More, I'll talk more on this later on. But if you're not in it, get in it if you're serious about this career. Okay? It's my life's work. So with CHF, we now know what it is. Great. Well, what are the risk factors? Okay. Well, the risk factor of, ha of having heart trouble, there's, I have a mnemonic for this. Now, this mnemonic is not my own mnemonic. I actually got this mnemonic from one of my mentors, John Belinsky, who's a PA. So the mnemonic for anything cardiac is called SAD CHF. Okay. And he's allowed me to pass this on to you guys. So SAD CHF. Okay. So, smoking, and I know this is a little small, I'm gonna say it to you out loud, but sad CHF. Age, so a, a high age, diabetes, family history, I know it's small, I'm gonna just tell it to you. See, I always, when, I'm, when I'm doing this, I'm always thinking about you. I'm always thinking about you. Okay, how, how, are you, how, how are you going to see this? Cholesterol, so high cholesterol, and then high blood pressure. Now, I'm going to say it so you got it. Sad CHF, so risk factors of having CHF, smoking, age over 40, 50, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, Family history. Are there other things? Yeah, sure. There definitely could be other things. Sure. You know, obviously, you know, al alcoholics, not going to be good for the heart, right? But these are the main things. These are the main players with anything cardiac. If you know these, you're in a pretty good shape. What's the worst one? If I had to pick one, well, I'd say, can I pick two? I'm going to pick two. I would say diabetes and family history would probably be the two worst. If you, if you were a diabetic, like a type 2 diabetic maybe, and you have a family history of heart trouble, those are the ones you want to watch out for, right? Because maybe I can fix this. Maybe I can fix this. I can fix this. I can't fix this. And I can't fix this. And it's hard to fix diabetes, isn't it? Especially if it's your type 1 that can't fix it. So that, that's, that's where I'm at. Hopefully we can, hopefully we can avoid some of these. Fair? We can avoid most of them, but not all of them. The smoking, we can avoid. Okay. Especially in this job. I agree. agree. Okay, so we got what is we got the risk factors. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? 
You already know them. You already know them. So a sign and symptoms of CHF. Okay, what are the hallmark sign symptoms? Well, JVD, right? We know if somebody goes into cardiogenic shock, they're going to be hypotensive because they're in shock, right? So it's kind of like a pathway. If I start off with heart failure, right, maybe I'm in heart failure because I'm having a heart attack. Or maybe I'm in heart failure because I'm having a flare-up of my CHF. My already weakened heart is having a, a, weak, a, weakened, a weakening event, okay? <laughs> Couldn't get that one out, right? Or maybe, like I told you about earlier, the heart's under, under, under stress from pneumothorax. Maybe there's a tamponade, whatever. Whatever's going on, the heart's failing as a pump, right? At some point, we're going to enter one of two pathways. In CHF, we're going to enter cardiogenic shock, okay? What are the two things that cause cardiogenic shock? Heart attack and CHF. Cardiogenic, here I am, cardiogenic shock is the heart's fault. Cardiogenic shock, the way to remember it, remember it is it is the heart's fault that you're in shock right now. The heart has failed its duty as a pump, and it's failed because either I'm having CHF right now, or I had a heart attack and my heart muscle is just dead, man. It's dead, and I can't pump anymore because the heart's dead. That's it, okay? Obstructive shock is when blood flow is being obstructed by something else. That could be a tamponade. That could be a pulmonary embolism. Um, that could be attention to thorax, right? Now, I, now, while I'm on it, let me slip you the other ones. I'm going to give you a little quick tip, okay? Distributive shock is the one where there's three subtypes. That's the one we have the abnormal vasodilation, right? And then uh, the final classic shock is hypovolemia, hypovolemia, okay? So remember distributive shock. Is going to be anaphylactic, septic, neurogenic, okay? Sepsis is bacteria in the blood. Neurogenic is brain spinal cord issue, right? Anaphylaxis, two or more body systems are being affected by an allergen. And now I've gotten to the stage where I'm in hypotension. You are only in shock, my friends, if you have hypotension. You're not in shock if you're not in hypotension. You're on your way to it. So we got to respond and treat you before that. Cool? Science yeah. symptoms, we just went over of CHF, right? JVD, rails. So I'm going to write these out because there's, there's a lot, okay? The first one is JVD. Second one is rails. Now, what's rails? Everybody watching the live right now, I want you to go like this. I want you to take some hair and rub it against your ear like this. If you don't have hair, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll pay for that one day. Go like this. That's what, that's what rails sounds like. Okay. You're going to hear rails on both sides because the blood is coming up. You're going to have JVD. Okay. You have JVD. I'm going to be doing a video soon reacting to a video of someone putting an IV in when they had JVD. Okay. You'll see it coming soon. Okay. It's, it's in production. Okay. What else are we going to have? Well, we're going to have chest pain. We have difficulty breathing. And eventually, we're going to have, eventually, if we get into cardiac shock, hypotension. At first, we're going to have hypertension. At first. And then hypotension later on. But CHF. Okay. So there's those are the main players. The rails, the JVD, that the pink frothy sputum. If I was to pick three players, we all know chest pain to really breathing. These are your main three players. If I was to give you three main players, okay? Knowing what you learned earlier, okay? 
Now, the final piece is a treatment. How do we actually treat? How do we actually treat CHF? Well, what we would do in this case with CHF is this is where we use. We, now, I, somebody had a question. I'm, I'm going to do it real quick. That's about aspirin in CHF. If I go to a patient and they have chest pain again, I can give them aspirin. But with CHF specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to do nitroglycerin and we're going to do CPAP. Okay, those are going to be the two main things. If I had only two things, nitro, 0.4 milligrams, sublingual, CPAP's going to be the, CPAP is the main thing. And we're, of course, we get IVs. Of course, we're going to do an EKG, see if they're having a heart attack, a STEMI, okay? But CPAP and nitro, just remember those. Now, the last one we have tonight is going to be COPD. So here we go. Now, I'm going to break this up for you, and then, and then we're going to go into the, our final little piece, okay? Our final piece of the live stream. We are at 1, 1, 11, 1 hour and 11 minutes. If you are on the replay or the live right now, let's go. Give me a let's go in the comments. Give me a live right now if you're live. If you have not smashed that like button, if you have not hit subscribe, please share with me, share with me, another YouTuber out there. Similar here to the paramedic coach. I don't think anyone's similar. You think so? I don't think so. Okay. That is putting in an hour and 11 minute live stream just for you here. I don't see him. You? I don't see him. Right? That's why I'm here, folks. That's why I'm here. Okay. I'm here for you. Okay. Give me a hashtag live. Give me a hashtag replay. Thank you for all the kind words. Let's get back to it. Okay. So COPD, what is it? Well, I'm going to write a slight thing here. There's two things. There's chronic bronchitis, there's chronic bronchitis, and there's emphysema, like we hear in the commercials. Okay? So there's how many things? There's two things here. So get a good look. Okay? There's chronic bronchitis and emphysema. There's chronic bronchitis and emphysema in... C-O-P-D. Okay? Got it? What are they? Let's talk about it. Okay? Here it is. Chronic bronchitis, emphysema, in COPD. Okay? Now, let me tell you what it is first. So, one, what it is. Okay. COPD is broken up into two main sections. Chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Now, I've said it about five, six times, you're never going to forget it. Good. Chronic bronchitis, let's break it down. Chronic means lasts a long time. Bronchitis, the bronchioles are the highways of the air exchange in our lungs. It's the highway system of the lungs. And there's highways in the road that cars drive on. Well, air drives in and out of us through our bronchioles, through our bronchioles. Right, we have main stem bronchi, bronchi, bronchioles. We go down. Okay. Now, with this bronchi and the bronchioles, if they become chronically anything chronic in medicine is over three months. How many months? Three months or more. It's a chronic disease or issue. Got it. Anything that ends in itis means it's inflamed or infected. So what this means, uh, Jacory says, go, let's go, man. Thank you so much. It means the world to me, brother. I appreciate that. Um, now, COPD, what we have is a, we have the bronchioles that are inflamed chronically. So imagine this. Imagine you have COPD and your bronchioles are inflamed every single day. What might you be on every day? A steroid. Because you need to, you have inflammation in your bronchioles. We need to take care of it, right? That's chronic bronchitis. Notice what I did there? It's not there, but maybe you remember it being there. It sticks in your brain. Hope, it, hope that little, little trick works, okay? The second piece, remember what was over here? Emphysema, yep, okay. Emphysema 
go down wall, go past the bronchioles, down here. Down in this bottom section, we have our alveoli. Kinky, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Uh, the, we have the alveoli. So with the alveoli, have you ever played a puzzle? Have you ever played a puzzle or a puzzle game? You have put all the pieces. So picture a perfect puzzle piece like this. It's a perfect puzzle. Here it is, okay? If I start taking off pieces, the puzzle gets messed up and it becomes kind of like a disfigurement. That's what happens to the alveoli in emphysema. What we have is we have alveoli, it's all disfigured. It's all, not, it's not the exchange of gases, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out, isn't very good because the alveoli is being destructed, being destructed. So in COPD, which one has alveoli being destructed? Emphysema. Which one is inflammation of the bronchioles? Chronic bronchitis. Could you have both? Could you just have one? Most patients have one, but there's no reason why you can't have both happen to you. But most of the time, it's one or the other. Fair, fair? Okay. Now, the thing about COPD I need you to know about is this. With diabetic patients, hang with me. Let me get a little water real quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pretty proud of myself, though. An hour and 16 minutes, no water. I, did, I, think, I, I think I did pretty good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of myself. Okay. Eric, you are correct. Yes. So Eric, uh, once you, Eric Allen, once you join the course, I give you an entire study plan. So you get access to 420 plus videos. It's EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic. It's all in there. And once you sign up, there's six different study plans, depending on where you are in your career when you join the course. So all you do is you watch the video on your study plan and you just go all through it. Um, for you at your level, you're going to do like some anatomy and physiology. You're going to have uh, all the EMT sections, skills, clinical tips, all that, brother. And again, unlike other programs, when you join my program, I give you everything up front. Like I give you EMT, advanced EMT and paramedic. So like my whole goal is I want to get the student in as early as possible, because if you can join my program as an EMT, well, you paid once, you have lifetime access, and you never have to pay for anything else. Again, you have everything you need in the course. And some people say it sounds too, too good to be true. No, I, this is why I made it, because no one has done it. <laughs> you know, that's why I did it, because I want to help you, and I have all the information, so it's all there. So, yeah, that, that's what we get, man. So sign up. It'll be the best money ever spent as far as education. I look forward to your success. All right. Now back to this. Um, we're talking here about COPD. Now, what are the risk factors of getting COPD? Well, with COPD, you you may have heard about people that are in you know Navy shipyards or people that worked in factories or worked in hazard, hazardous environments or smokers. That's all correct. That's all correct. Those are the risk factors. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? Well, You've probably heard of this mnemonic that I have. If you haven't, excuse me, I'll share it with you now. Called AAC. So if a patient is wheezing, patient is wheezing, asthma, anaphylaxis, COPD. So wheezing is going to be primary. Okay. So I, I, you're probably saying, Evan, you were talking about diabetes and someone had a question. I know. Let me go back on that. So what I was trying to say, my friends, is this, you know how we have diabetic patients and their blood glucose level is like their own. So if someone's a diabetic, the textbook might tell you that the, a normal blood sugar is 70 to 120, right? 
But then you, your diabetic patient says, oh, well, my normal is 150. So, we, so if you take their blood sugar and it's 155, pretty much normal. It's not high for them. It's their normal. See, with COPD, same thing. With COPD, not the blood sugar, we're talking about oxygen levels. So uh, a, COPD, a COPD patient's oxygen levels are not going to be 99%. And as they gradually get worse with the disease, eventually they're going to be on nasal oxygen. And they're going to be on one or two or three or four liters of oxygen in the home. And they'll be at home oxygen. And they won't be able to move around very much unless they have their oxygen on them. So over time, when they first get diagnosed, they'll be like 98, 97%, 96. And then they'll get 94, 95, 90. They can even be under 94%. And that could be normal for them on room air oxygen. So they need oxygen to maintain their level. So if you ever go to a COPD patient, remember, they're probably going to be on home oxygen. And they're probably going to be on steroids. So if you're doing an IV, their skin is going to be very, very thin, very, very weak skin. So you want to be careful. You want to hold your skin taut. Make sure you hold that vein down. Okay. That's number two. Uh, the third thing you want to ask them is, uh, is there any uh, new medications? If they change their medications, it may have caused a flare up, right? Have they done any activity out of the ordinary, right? These are questions you want to ask the COPD patient. Now, the treatment of this patient is, is we pretty much know it already. Well, of course, we would, we would give steroids to the patient, right? To, because that's going to help them, obviously, inflammation. But we're going to give them uh, albuterol. We're going to give them uh, dual NED treatments. We're going to open the lungs up. And depending on where you are, it's not a primary treatment. The primary treatment is going to be NEBS and steroids for COPD. Could you give somebody with COPD CPAP? You could, but it's more of a later, a late, a, a later stage than the first stage. And in some areas, they say, oh, oh we don't, we don't, that's, that's against our protocol. We don't do that. So I don't want to get you confused here. I want you to think, what do we need to do with this patient? We need to get the inflammation the best we can manage in their bronchi, and we need to open the bronchi to get their oxygen back to their normal so they can sit at home and be relaxed on their oxygen. That's all. So we got to open and then deal with the inflammation. NEBS, steroids. IV, don't forget, do an EKG. And by the way, by the way, if you're a paramedic, I'm, I want to give you one piece of advice, um, and then I'm, I'm going to uh, you know, do some shout-outs and we'll wrap up. <clears throat> if you are a, a paramedic and you are ever, ever concerned that you should do an EKG, never be scared to do an EKG. If your patient has pain from their, you know, the, their neck to their hip, you can do an EKG, okay? It's warranted, okay? Don't be that paramedic that assumes that, don't be that paramedic that assumes that pain right here in the epigastrum, the stomach, is, oh, well, it's not right here in their chest, so it can't be cardiac. Don't be that paramedic. If somebody has upper abdominal pain, you should be doing an EKG, okay? If you call 911, for nausea, vomiting, back pain, upper abdominal pain, wouldn't you want the medic doing a 12 week EKG? That used to piss me off so much uh, when I when I was in back when I was an EMT, you know, starting up, um, and I'd be in medic school and I'd be like, what is going on, you know? So I want to share that with you. Don't be that medic. Do an EKG. You know, always think worst case scenario. Always do the best for your patient and never be lazy. You cannot do bad by your patient if you are hyper-focused, think worst-case scenario, and are there for them and get to their level, right? And remember, if somebody is calling 911 and it's this is their worst day, it might not be the worst call that you've seen, 
but it's the worst call and worst day they've been on, right? So please remember that. And yes, you'll see a variety of calls throughout this. You'll see all kinds of people, but just remember that. If this person's not in the best state right now, they're calling 911 and you're there. Fair? This is what you signed up for. Fair? Great. Okay. Now, people, a lot of people in the comments are asking about my video study course and what it does. Now, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, this is a small little baby piece of what it's like inside my video study course and the content and the teaching style that I have, okay? Now, my video study course includes 420, now I'll, I'll show you here, okay? I'm gonna break it down for you a little bit, okay? So my video study course includes 420 plus videos of content, okay? Cool. Now, what does it do and who, who does it serve? Really three main types of people. So the first person is someone who's preparing for school. The second person is someone in school right now. The third is if you're getting ready for NREMT. Now, this was my mission with creating this. And I'll put the link in the comments right now. It's the first link in the description. I have some more to share with you, okay? Here it is. Link in, link in the chat as well, okay? Now, if you are somebody who is preparing for EMT, advanced EMT, or paramedic school, the number one reason why students fail is because EMS schooling is extremely accelerated. I, I'll share a story with you. When I first went into EMT class, we had about 80 plus people. Only about 20 of us actually graduated. And I had an incredible instructor, incredible instructor, when I was in EMT class back in 2011. Okay? When I went to paramedic school, we started off at 30 people. We only graduated about 14 people. After, I'm um, sorry, after first semester, we were only down, we were down to 14 people. And I had the best instructor of my life when I was in paramedic school. So it wasn't the instructors. So what was it? It was the acceleration of school that caught up with the student. So what I have my students do, and I have mentored over 10,000 students in my video study course on this is if you prepare yourself before you go into school, if you're leveling up to EMT, advanced EMT or paramedic, you can start going through the content, the core content now in class. If you're struggling in school right now, I have sections. Again, you get access to everything, lifetime access, EMT, advanced EMT, and paramedic. Every, all the main content you're learning in school, you, I'm covering in the course. And I'm going to break down what's in the course in a moment. And then I have entire sections. I have two main sections. It's called the NREMT Accelerator. Okay. I have a basic life support for EMTs and advanced life support for advanced EMT and paramedics. So this is the exact app, the exact course prep course that I give to you if you're getting ready for a national registry. People ask, what's the best app for national registry? What do I do for a national registry? I have my state exam. What do I do? Right? Well, I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't open up your textbook that's this big and try to study all that in a few weeks' time. It's, too, it's information overload, just how class was, too much, right? What you don't do is take a bunch of practice test questions because all you're doing is memorization. And also, 
I don't care what any of these companies say. They do not know exactly what's on the NRAMT. They can take an educated guess. They can kind of give you some good questions. But you should not rely, rely on them alone. My friends, if you saw my personal messages, you would see students coming to me every single day. Oh, I tried practice questions in my book. It didn't work. And they come to me and they pass. You can go to my Instagram. You can look at my website. You can see the student results. I have so much results with this program. I don't even have enough hours in the day to post all the results. And again, I know it sounds crazy. You're probably like, how is this? How is all this in one place? Because I worked my ass off and my, my butt off to make it happen. <laughs> okay? That's how. Like, literally. Like, I had a dream that this was going to happen. Like, I was going to put this together so that people wouldn't struggle anymore. And I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. And I did it. Okay? So, final piece. What's in the course? Okay? Here are all, I'm going to tell you right now, all the sections you get with the course. Now, you don't just get the course by itself. You also get access to me as your coach in our private student group, okay? Not everyone that uh, joins the course joins the student group, but in that student group right now, we have close to 5,000 people that are active, you know, who's active in that group. And we're always going back and forth. You can ask questions. I literally check the group at least twice a day and answer questions. So I'm right there for you. You have questions, I'll hit you up, okay? Now, there's 420 videos in this course. And unlike these apps that you buy for one month and then they charge you every month and you only use it for NREMT and it's like, you know, 30 or 60 or 100 bucks a month or whatever whatever it is, and you only use it for NREMT, but then you don't pass your NREMT, I'm giving you a lifetime access to this program and it's going to help you literally from before school all the way throughout your all the way from pre EMT all the way to your first day as a paramedic. Okay. Now hang with me. You get the following in this course. Okay. I have an entire anatomy and physiology prep course over 120 videos long and also includes worksheets like you would get in class that are you know made by me and you can go through some are matching. Some are labels, okay? So you understand AMP. Remember the heart blood flow? If you don't understand heart blood flow, then you're not going to get right. Well, there's more than heart blood flow. we got to know the bones, the muscle, the skin, everything, right? It's in there. So you first get my AMP course. That's included in the video course of 420 videos. That alone is worth the amount of money that it is, okay? But you get more. You also get access to my NREMT accelerator. So how to actually get ready for NREMT, okay? I also have, remember, this is every single level, EMT, advanced EMT, and paramedic. Everything I break down here, every level's covered. They have their own section, okay? You get clinical tips. So if you're a new EMT, a new advanced EMT, a new paramedic, you're doing your clinicals. You're out on the road, ride time. I include my best clinical tips so you can get better at your job. We're done. We're moving on. See, I'm taking you throughout your career, right? AMP, the fundamentals. We pass on our EMT. Then we have clinical tips. What about medications? I cover all of the EMS drug cards. So, so many paramedic students struggle with drug cards, my friends. I've broken down every single drug card with the whiteboard right here. I've written them out for you. All you got to do is write them down and put them on your flashcard and go to class and you're ready to go. It's all there. Okay. EMS meds. If you're struggling with medications, get the course just for that. I break it all down. Okay. I also break down prescription medications. Okay. So, if you ever looked at a patient's med list and you have no idea what it is, I cover all the common meds, hypertensive meds, insomnia meds, HIV meds, all different types. I cover in there, okay? 
What else? I give you career advice. Okay. I give you career advice section. And these are all the sections. These are multiple videos in these sections for each level in one program. Give you career advice. Okay. I also break down skills. I have a, you can't see it. I have a mannequin. I have a table. I have equipment. If you don't know, I actually have a full life pack here. Pretty cool. Okay. So I break down stuff like the cardiac monitor, intubation, King LT, right? Advanced airways, BVM, CPR, right? IV access, EMS skills, skills you got to know, right? And we zoom in, we go slow. It's like I'm, I'm your lab instructor where I'm breaking it down with you. That's in the course, okay? EMS skills, we call that. Pretty cool. Okay, so we got A&P course, NREMT prep, clinical tips, EMS meds, prescription meds, career advice, EMS skills, all inside of one course, all inside of one program. But remember the prep? I also have school prep. So what do you watch before going to school? The school prep sections. All inside, shot right here in studio, inside the course. Okay? Now, you get all of this. All you got to do, click the link in the description. I'll give you a lifetime access to the course right now. Okay? Now, the website is prepare. I'll put it, uh, put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. It is prepareforems.com. You can get lifetime access right now to everything here. Lifetime access. My friends, I hope you enjoyed the live. Hope you had a good time tonight. Click the first link in the description. Prepare from EMS.com. Get yourself lifetime access to the video study course, my friends. And if you haven't yet, hit smash that like button. Hit subscribe. And I will see you Next time, much love, everybody. I'll see you in the course. Get that course, and I look forward to your success inside of EMS. Let's go. See you guys. Have a good night. Much love, everybody. Peace, peace.